Uh, greetings, friends, and happy Sabbath to all those of you who are keeping it. I would like to address a couple of doctrinal errors that are taught by the Jehovah's Witnesses. One of those errors of, is, of course, the, their teaching on the Sabbath, and the other error is called the Times of the Gentiles. Now, uh, there are two fundamental, the, these are two fundamental doctrines of the Jehovah's Witnesses, and the doctrines are presented as, pu as published in their own literature, and they're examined for validity. Now, the first doctrine is the times of the Gentiles, as I said, and the second one will be the observance of the Sabbath. Now, as far as the times of the Gentiles, I'll be now quoting from uh, their writing, one of their writings, which is uh, from the Watchtower, their magazine, and this is article published on January the 1st, 1983, and on page 11, we read the following. Who were the ones that pointed out to the whole world that the times of the Gentiles would end in the latter half of 1914? It was the, indeed, international Bible students using the columns of the Watchtower magazine. Today, they are known as known worldwide as Jehovah's Witnesses. In 1940, the anti-typical spiritual kingdom of God, in the hands of His anointed Son, Jesus Christ, started there in the heavens. The fact that this is disputed by the religious leaders of Christendom and others makes it an issue of the highest importance, and we must face it. End of the quote. Well, dear friends, true, the issue of Christ's return and the establishment of his kingdom is of major importance, so let's take the challenge of the Watchtower and, as they said, face it. The Jehovah's Witnesses base 1914 as the end of the times of the Gentiles from a prophecy in Daniel chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. The prophecy describes the chopping down of a huge tree that was left rooted and alive, but restrained with a band of iron and copper and given the heart of a wild beast until seven times had passed. An understanding of the tree of Daniel 4 is indeed necessary if we are to know the proper application of the prophecy. Who then is this huge tree that is hewn down? Verse 22 explains it pictures Nebuchadnezzar, king of the Babylonian Empire. The interpretation, as revealed in verses 20 through 24, shows that Nebuchadnezzar himself would be cut down and restrained for seven times. And indeed he was. For seven years he was subdued as a beast of the field, after which he became even greater and excellent majesty was added to him. This is all the prophecy in Daniel chapter 4 and in within the verses 19 through 37. Now, as Nebuchadnezzar was the symbol of the Babylonian Empire, the prophecy could also be applied to the empire itself. After its fall, a period of seven times, or seven times 360 years, using the day-for-year principle, which we find in Numbers 14.34 and in Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6. So after a period of seven times, or seven times 36, three, uh, sorry, seven times 360 years, would pass until it could again rise. And these times of the Gentiles, mentioned by Jesus Christ in Luke 21, verse 24, so this time of the Gentiles then lasts for 2,520 years. It must be dated from the fall of the Babylonian Empire, which occurred in 539 before Christ. Thus, its conclusion in the year 1982 of our, uh, of our, of our age, 1982 AD. So, again, this is one of those major, uh, prophets, major, uh, I wanted to say prophetic errors of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, well, what I've just said that this has to add until 1982. This is quote from the Mainstream Civilization 4th edition, authored by Joseph Strayer, and it was published by Harcourt Bracha Jovanovic Publishers in San Diego, page 23. So again, this was all again published in uh, within the publishing activities of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Because you see, the, the error is in this. The Jehovah's Witnesses started their account in the year 607 before Christ, which is the approximate, the approximate date of the fall of Judah, and then they arrive at 1914. Thus, 
they have two fundamental errors. First error is they apply this prophecy to Christ's kingdom when it clearly refers to Babylon. And the second fundamental error is they begin their countdown 68 years too early from the fall of Judah instead of using the fall of Babylon in 539 before Christ. So this is, as you see, the very first fundamental doctrinal error in the teaching of Jehovah's Witnesses. The second one, as I mentioned, is observance of the Sabbath. Well, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses state that Sabbath observance was given only to the Jews and ended with the Mosaic Law. They mention that by quoting all kinds of New Testament scriptures in their publication, Jehovah's Witnesses, Who Are They? It was published in 1979 by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society in New York, and this is all published on page 13. So let's now take a look at what they quote. The scriptures they use to defend uh, their position that Sabbath observance was given only to the Jews and ended with the Mosaic Law are Deuteronomy 5.15, Exodus 31, 13, Romans 10, 4, Galatians 4, 9 and 10, and Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. You see, using these very scriptures one by one, let us now examine the validity of their belief. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 15. And remember that you were a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out of thence through a mighty hand and by a stretched out arm. Therefore the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. Deuteronomy 5.15 So is calling to remembrance for the entire nation of Israel, not just the Jews or the tribe of Judah. So uh, it's, you know, the, the remembrance for the entire nation of Israel of the command to observe the Sabbath. Israel who had spent 400 years in slavery, had forgotten that their ancestors from Adam through Abraham and Jacob kept this weekly Sabbath holy, as we see from Genesis chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. Right there at the creation week, God established the Sabbath. Before the nation of Israel was in existence, before the Mosaic law came into existence, before any Jew was out there, we have the Sabbath commandment since the very uh, creation of, of creation since the very creation of the whole earth and heavens. So, this scripture, Deuteronomy 5.15, in no way indicates that Sabbath observance was to be a temporary command. Exodus 31.13 Speak thou unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. Well, Exodus 31, 13 clearly states that the Sabbath of God, where the Sabbaths in plural, as you can see, were to be a sign between God and the children of Israel. It does not indicate a temporary observance, but rather, it says, throughout your generations. Today, the physical descendants of Israel can be traced to include the general populace of the United States, the former British Commonwealth nations, the Jews, and much of the Western societies indeed. And the spiritual descendants are true Christians, as we read in Galatians 3.29, and therefore, physically or spiritually, it seems the Jehovah's Witnesses should observe the Sabbath as they claim to know the God of the Old Testament. Perhaps now we wonder if they really do know <laughs> J-H-V-H, the Tetragrammaton, Yehovah or Jehovah. We really wonder if they really do know Jehovah. Obviously not. Romans 10.4 For Christ is the end of the law, for righteousness to everyone that believes. Romans 10.4, as you can see, dear friends, makes no reference to ending one of the most significant observances of the law. Instead, that Christ himself is the end of the law, meaning the end result and outcome, for it was he who lived in perfect obedience to the laws of God, and set an example that we are to follow. It is Christ who epitomized the law and magnified it so that we could more easily understand how to obey it. Why would God so obscurely declare an end to his law when Jesus Christ himself preached their observance? Well, you all know from Matthew 5, chapter 5, verses 17 through 19, he came to fulfill the law and set the examples for all of us to be fulfilling it throughout our Christ-like lives. Galatians 4 9 and 10. But now, ra uh, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements 
whereunto you desire again to be in bondage, you observe days and months and times and years. Well, look, if Galatians 4, 9 and 10 refers to the law of God, then calling them the weak and beggarly elements is of total contradiction to Paul's own testimony that, Romans 7, 12, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. If Paul was referring to Jewish laws, then he would not have mentioned the observance of times, which Leviticus 19.26 forbids. It is clear that Paul is speaking here to Gentiles, who are again turning to their pre-conversion customs, in which they were once in bondage and not at all degrading or diminishing from the observance of the Sabbath day. And finally, Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink in respect of a holiday or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Well, does Colossians 2, 16 and 17 teach us not to continue observing the Sabbath as commanded elsewhere in the Bible? Well, Paul instructs that no man is to judge you, but the body of Christ. As explained in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, the body of Christ is the church, the true church. Paul's admonition to the church at Colossae was not to allow men to instruct you on obedience to God's laws, but only the church. How plain. The truth of God, dear friends, is simple, clear, and constant. The identifying sign of God's people does remain among those who continue to obey His laws, which will endure forever. The Jehovah's Witnesses do not have that identifying sign.